Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Futurati Podcast, where we dive into how emerging technologies will impact the world and your bank account. I'm Trent Fowler, and joining me, as always, is my co-host, Thomas Fry. Thomas and I are futurists, keynote speakers, and consultants with decades of experience in analyzing trends and communicating new developments to audiences across the world. Reach out to us at futuratipodcast.com slash contact dash futurati if you'd like to hire us for consulting, to speak at your event, or to advertise on this podcast. Thomas, we just had uh, AI alignment safety researcher Dave Shapiro on to talk to us about his approach to alignment. What did you get out of the conversation? I, I found it absolutely fascinating because there's uh, um, there's so much talk about how how AI can go wrong and go off the rails, um, but there's there's also a lot of talk about how uh, if AI is smart enough to uh, go off the rails and take over the world, it's also smart enough to know when it shouldn't do that. Um, yeah, and so all of his thinking is is oriented around how do we how do we create those checks and balances internally in the uh, kind of in the alignment code for AI um, so that it, it's kind of self correcting. And uh, uh, I don't I don't know if there's a better way of saying that, but <laughs> he he actually elaborates on it in quite an interesting way. I agree. One one thing I really appreciate about Dave is that he tries to tackle the actual object level problem directly, right? I, I will have to think about like the extent to which I agree with his conclusions and his solution generally, but I do like the fact that he saw this problem and he got really into neuroscience and philosophy and a, the AI safety question and, and all these other domains and areas of research and tried to synthesize a set of principles which he believes will uh, align advanced agents in a way that's consistent with human values. And I, mean, I wish him the best of luck. I, I will follow his work, you know, long into the future, I'm sure. And the, the conversation was was fascinating. There's a lot of back and forth between he and I. I think we, we take different perspectives on the problem, but uh, I, I think we both came away more enriched for it. Yeah, it's it's one of these things where I wish we can interview him two years from now and kind of uh, uh, do a retrospective uh, kind of understanding of what did we think back then and what do we think now? How has that changed? And uh, have we have we destroyed the world in, in between then and now? <laughs> right. So the world has been destroyed, Dave. Thoughts? No. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, uh, if, if he's open to it, I'd love to do follow-up interviews in the future. I mean, we barely even scratched the surface. I, I did read parts of, he's got like three or four books. I read parts of all of them. And we spent almost all the time talking about his heuristic imperatives approach, but there's a lot that could be said about, you know, his understanding of neuroscience or moral philosophy. I'm given to understand he's working on a book on moral philosophy now. So there's really a lot to to think about. He's a, a great guy, very deep thinker. And, uh, you know, hopefully you all enjoy this interview with Dave Shapiro. Tonight, we're joined by David Shapiro. David is a former engineer who became famous through his dozens of well-received tutorials on YouTube, covering everything from fine-tuning chat GPT to his proposed solution to the alignment problem. His work focuses on ensuring that advanced technologies are used safely, bringing about an abundant, post-scarcity, post-nihilistic future. If you enjoy this interview, please subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. And don't forget to check out our website, futuripodcast.com. David, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Let's hear a little bit about your background, your interests, and what brought you to working on the problems that you're working on now. Yeah. So, I mean, like so many people my age, I, I grew up watching uh, Star Trek. I remember um, uh, the night that Star Trek Generations came out, I got to stay up really super late. I think I was like six, and we were visiting my uncle, and like my whole, my whole family's a bunch of nerds. And so, you know, you see those images, you see those ideas, and... Um, you know, I was fascinated by warp drive and stuff. And actually, when I was little, I wanted to uh, ultimately study physics and invent warp drive. But uh seems that fate, uh, <laughs> fate took me a different direction. And now I'm working on artificial intelligence. But that's kind of that's kind of where it all started. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of the, the real the real high level where it, where it all got started. But then, uh, you know, fast forward, I, I made the mistake of growing up and becoming an adult. So I had to get a <laughs> career going. <laughs> 
<laughs> and um and yeah and so i uh i got into it you know I was always into technology it just kind of made sense it was a relatively low barrier of entry um got really good at automation and virtualization and cloud and that is actually really really close to like a lot of the skills will translate to data science and machine learning and artificial intelligence because it's like hey you got to automate a whole bunch of database queries and all kinds of other stuff and so then it was just a really small jump um, and actually I started kind of studying, uh, artificial intelligence in my, as a hobby back in like 2009, only a couple of years into my career. And then, you know, fast forward to, uh, transformer technology, GPT-2, GPT-3, and the rest is history. So it was just, it was time to, you know, I've been working towards this for like more than 10 years. So then I made the switch and, and, uh, you know, here we are today. So, so yeah. what is it that you're currently doing? I mean, are, are you in... AI safety researcher professionally, or are you making money off the YouTube channel? Yeah. So, I mean, for, for money, I consult. Um, that's, that's primarily what I do is, uh, you know, my, my YouTube channel is just kind of the platform that I, I built because I realized that I was onto something with a lot of my work. You know, uh, you mentioned, uh, if your audience isn't familiar, I've written a few books on it. I've got a YouTube channel with about 120 videos uh, that are public right now. Um, almost 200 open source, uh, experiments on GitHub. Uh, and so like, as I was doing this research, I realized like, Hey, I need to get my name out there, but like, I don't have a PhD, you know, I didn't go to MIT or Stanford or anything like that. So I needed to build up credibility. So I did it the hard way, uh, via YouTube and social media. Um, and so then once I got the credibility, then people kept coming to me, Oh man, this was, this was a kind of a funny story. Like, I was just like, no, I'm just researching. I'm just researching. And people kept coming to me and like wanting to hire me. And I'm like, no, go away. I'm just doing research <laughs> no, publicly. Money. Right. Yeah. And so, but eventually a few of them convinced me to, to try it out. And, you know, I tried the startup route and I got super, super burned out from doing startups or trying to do a startup rather. Uh, and I just realized that culture isn't for me. Um, but yeah, yeah. So now I do, I do consulting and then all of the work that I do, whether it's, you know, research experiments, whatever, it's all just immediately open source public domain. Cause that's, uh, that's really my core mission. Um, Bill, you have a question uh, now. Yeah. yeah. Warp, warp drive is not, uh, mutually exclusive from AI. Um, you, you see yourself routing around back into the warp drive, uh, mode sometime in the future. You know, uh, uh, two of, two of my best friends are actually physicists and they're in slightly different, uh, domains. And I know enough about math and physics to know that it is incredibly confusing. <laughs> uh, and, and also probably, probably not for me cause I'm a really big picture thinker. That's like, that's the thing that has really kind of come, come to the forefront as, as a systems engineer, as a systems thinker, uh, you know, I take a very global perspective on things which is that kind of helped me understand like all the historical context as to where we're at as a species philosophically and why we view AI the way that we do and, and, you know, that, that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I kind of get, I, I get kind of bogged down whenever we have to, whenever I have to like look at the nitty gritty and the, the math and stuff. And I try and try and delegate that to other people. <laughs> uh, but you know, I could probably help with uh with the warp drive research uh by way of ai um accelerating some of the research around it and and helping build the tools that that enable the research but also um one of the one of the underlying principles of my entire career was uh i don't know if this is actually a true uh quotation but henry ford allegedly said give your hardest problems to the laziest engineers they'll find an easier way to do it and that is me to a T. That's why I got into automation. I was like, yeah, I'm just going to write a script to do this for me instead. <laughs> so, and that's, that's the ultimate purpose of AI is like, you know what? You just go do that for me. So, uh, that's, that's, that's my solution to so <laughs> inventing warp drive at some point in the future. Well, yeah, I actually, I've actually uh, spent a lot of time working with chat GPT, trying to figure out how to tease out, uh, information from it to, um, so if I'm working on a startup, as an example, I will, will go in and ask it a series of questions to try to pull out the information that I need to, to do something. And I found that that actually works really well, uh, because it opens the doors for lots of possibilities that I hadn't considered. And, uh, so I'm able to look at the overall problem from, uh, uh, from quite a few different vantage points. And I find that to be quite refreshing. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
So, um, th- so that that gets into the startup world, which you you said you're not exactly a big fan of, but um, I've I I found that I work kind of um, I feel pretty comfortable on the messy front end of things, and uh, that, that's a little different territory than most people like like to spend their time on. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No. And and you're right. Uh, one thing that is really curious about you know Chat GPT and of course all the other chatbots is um, a lot of people have learned to communicate differently uh, because of the chatbot phenomenon. So for instance, uh, you probably realized early on like you have to give it context. Like it'll make it'll it, it's happy to make assumptions, right? But more often than not, those assumptions are incorrect. But then you so that kind of trains you to say, okay, I know that I need to give you a certain amount of context up front so that you can engage in this conversation because it doesn't have any persistent memory. They're working on that now. I don't know if you guys have seen the uh, the chat GPT, the custom instructions. I was playing around with that. Um, so you can give it some persistent long-term memory uh, manually. And of course, there's plenty of people working on chatbots that have a long-term memory. But it's it's really funny because uh, some, some comments on my YouTube channel, when I've mentioned like, you know, learning to communicate better uh, with chat GPT and stuff like that, someone's like, yeah, I just told my wife to talk to me like I'm chat GPT and that just works so much better. <laughs> That's just, you have to be very clear, very explicit and you know provide <laughs> adequate context. And then the conversation goes so much better. And if you don't like it, you can always just say as a large language model, I, I can't do that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dave, I'm not allowed to respond like that. Right. Right. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, you, you become sort of well-known for AI safety, uh, thinking and, uh, novel approach to the whole subject. So could you just by way of introduction, give us a brief overview of the problem that you're attempting to solve, and then we'll get into heuristic imperatives and all the nitty gritty details. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, so before I answer, I have to provide a little bit of context. Like I am not a conventional machine learning researcher or, or data scientist. I've kind of come at it sideways, as I mentioned, um, earlier in the, the episode, uh, you know, I, I, I came from IT infrastructure, so deploying petabyte scale, uh, you know, corporate systems, that sort of thing. So I do have a tremendous amount of technical chops, but not from a purely scientific perspective. I'm more on the, on the, the practical perspective. I've worked with software architects, cloud architects, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I grew up, I saw, uh, my parents made the mistake of letting me see uh, Terminator 2 when I was really little, uh, don't do that for your kids because I was terrified of nuclear explosions. Um, you know, but then again, everyone from, you know, previous generations was terrified of nukes as well. So it's like, Hey, you know, welcome to the club. Uh, but anyways, so, you know, I grew up with these narratives of, uh, you know, super intelligent AI is going to kill everyone. And then, you know, the matrix came out and it was kind of, you know, humanity clinging on, you know, to the, to hanging on by a thread. Um, you know, and, and the only way that we could be valuable to the machines is if, you know, they use our brains as co-processors or something like that, just these really dark narratives. And so when I was little and growing up, it was just kind of a foregone conclusion that artificial intelligence was going to be dangerous. Um, and of course, you know, I'm a big fan of Star Trek and, and Star Wars and stuff where, you know, in Star Wars, like the machines are actually relatively benign, you know, like C-3PO is kind of this, you know, fuddy duddy useless, like wannabe metal professor um and r2d2 is just like this you know swiss army knife that's happy to help at all times and it's like you know so we've got these different uh, fictional models of how robots could be um you know either they're going to kill us all or they'll be somewhat useless and helpful uh in in varying degrees um and then of course you know commander data from star trek is kind of like a good balance right he's super smart superhuman strength very kind very compassionate wants to be more human and, uh, you know, back in 2009, I, I kind of tuned into neural networks as like, hey, this is obviously the way that we're going to achieve, you know, general intelligence or super intelligence. Why? Because the only example that we have of super intelligence or uh, strong intelligence is humans. And how do we work? We work with neural networks. So I thought that biomimicry was, was kind of the obvious way forward. And then fast forward about 10 years and I got access to GPT-2. So this is, this is the story that really kind of starts me on my path towards like alignment and, and safety. And I was like, okay, cool. I get access to GPT-2. I had been playing with Keras and like manually kind of, you know, creating artificial neural, deep, deep neural networks and 
programming layers and using evolutionary algorithms to find the right shape of the network, that sort of thing. And then I get access to GPT-2 and I was like, okay, well, let me go ahead and just try and take a stab at this alignment problem, this, this so-called impossible problem to solve to see if we can get machines to be safe. And so I had this idea that like, okay, you know, the, the idea of the paperclip maximizer, Nick Bostrom pu uh, published that, I think in like 2002, 2003. So that idea has been around. And the idea for that, for anyone who's not familiar, is that if, if you give a machine an objective function like maximize paperclips, if it's too intelligent, it can take that out to the nth degree and you can have all sorts of unintended consequences, right? The law of unintended consequences. And so it's like, okay, you know, it can't be all that bad, right? Like this is a, this is a, GPT-2 was the first like thinking machine, right? It can reason through things. It was really dumb, right? It could barely get through a sentence coherently, but it could. And so I was like, okay, let's do some experiments. And I started uh, with, with a really simple objective function. And this came from, uh, it, it was inspired by my study of Zen Buddhism. And so the objective function that I came up with was reduce suffering. I said, okay, that's, that should be pretty benign, right? Like if you, if you make a machine that's, that's only purpose in life is to reduce suffering, that's way better than like kill everyone or, you know, make paper clips or whatever, because that keeps the humans in context. So I synthesized a data set. I scraped a whole bunch of Wikipedia so that I had some training data to work with and, you know, formatted a data set and all that fun stuff. And I, I don't remember exactly how all the nitty gritty, but I, I fine-tuned GPT-2 so that whatever sentence you gave it, its response would be how to reduce suffering in that situation. And uh, I did a couple of experiments, and I was uh, I was struggling with chronic back pain at the time, um, you know, travesty of sitting at a desk all day. And so I just like, okay, cool. This was not in the training data, not in the data set that I created. So I was like, you yeah, know, there are 500 million people with chronic pain in the world today. What do you do about it? And GPT-2 and all of its infinite wisdom said, we should euthanize everyone that has chronic pain to reduce suffering. And I said, that's probably not what we want to achieve. So then I realized that the problem was a little bit harder than I initially thought. Uh, that, you know, if you, if you, you, you really could have this, this logically sound argument, but it was not kind of what you intended. And so that started me on this path of realizing that anytime you have a single optimization, a single objective function, it will be intrinsically unstable. And that is because the way that humans make decisions, and this is this led me on so many rabbit holes. I read up on philosophy, morality, ethics, uh, epistemology, like everything. And I realized that the, the thing that's missing from any idea about a single objective function is that's not how humans make decisions. We never consider just one variable or one goal. We always have, and most of this is unconscious, we ha always have dozens and dozens of goals uh, in our minds at any given time, and it changes throughout the day. It depends on whether or not you're hungry, whether or not you're lonely. It depends on how much money you have in the bank. There are so many things that play into decisions that we make. And so then I realized, okay, the solution here is not coming up with, you know, one objective function to rule them all, right? That's was never going to work. It was now we have to create a framework of multiple objectives that are sometimes in tension with each other, and that will form a self-stabilizing system. And so that led to my future work. And it took about two or three years from that moment to come up with my ultimate solution, the, the, what I originally called the core objective functions, but that's kind of a misnomer, and it's now named the heuristic imperatives. So that was a huge, long story. Where do you want to go from here? <laughs> Hello, this is Trent Fowler, co-host of the Futurati Podcast. One of the most common pieces of marketing advice I've come across is to know your audience and give them what they want. One difficulty in podcasting is that it's actually pretty hard to do this. None of the major platforms give us any way to reach out to you, our listeners, to find out what you enjoy about the Futurati Podcast and what you'd like to see done differently. So we've decided to record this commercial and ask you directly to reach out to us. Head over to futuratipodcast.com, go to the contact page, and drop us a line. Tell us about your favorite and least favorite episodes, what you'd like to see us cover in the future, and anything else you want us to know. We produce this show for you, and we want your advice so we can make it even better. Thank you.
Well, let's start with the three history comparatives, and then I'm going to uh, poke at it with quotes from the paper. So why, why don't you tell yeah. us what the three history comparatives are, and then we can get into mm -hmm. uh, what that's actually going to look like. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So the it like I said, it took about two or three years to really hammer it out. And this was a lot of experimentation. GPT-3 came out not too long after GPT-2. I applied for beta access. I got it. Um, I got really good at, at, at um, synthesizing data, fine-tuning it. And I, I I had to go back to the drawing board. I mean, I have got a bookshelf full of books. I've got a, I've got probably two um, shelves just full of neuroscience, cognition, philosophy, psychology, all the humanities. And so I just devoured so much knowledge trying to figure out, okay, what are the most universal principles here that you could align something to? And I kept reduced suffering. And the reason is because, I mean, every middle schooler learns this in biology, right? Is, is uh, stimuli, right? All living things react to stimuli. And stimuli can be positive or negative, right? If you, uh, if you poke your finger with a needle, that's a negative stimuli and you pull the needle away. If you put your hand on a hot, you know, hot plate or a burner, you, it hurts and you pull it away, a negative stimuli. You give a reward signal instead, you know, you give a kid a cookie or whatever, um, you give a, an adult a, a check. <laughs> a paycheck they'll keep doing the behavior that got the paycheck um and so i realized like okay so all this this became a very uh, apparent universal feature of life that we move away from bad stuff and towards good stuff and it took a while to find the right words for that obviously you know suffering that is a signal that is a, a, a signal that basically means it's a proxy for death and all living things want to avoid dying and one of the things that people are afraid of is that the machines will be afraid of dying, right? That that that, that if uh, a super intelligent machine has a sense of self-preservation, that it might decide to kill us just as a preemptive strike, right? Just to say, hey, you're the biggest threat to me, so let me kill you first. But I realized that if we have this in common, and this leads to the a later term that we'll get into called axiomatic alignment. Um, but so if we hold those ideas in common. You know, nobody wants to suffer, nobody wants to die. Okay, great. So let's move forward to, all right, if you're moving away from that, what are you moving towards? And, you know, I was like, all living things want to thrive. All living things want to flourish. And I, I actually did a lot of experiments with those two words and they didn't quite, the, the language models, GPT-3 didn't quite interpret them right. It's like, okay, well to thrive, you know, let's just grow more food. And I'm like, well, that's part of it, but that's not the whole thing. And, uh, you know, to flourish, that's like, you know, let's plant gardens everywhere and, you know, replant forests. And it's like, that, that's a good idea, but that's not, that's not really the sentiment that I was looking for. And so finally I was, um, I got my wife into Star Trek, um, because her dad showed her, showed her the original series back in the day. And of course, like, you know, just different generation. And, and so she remembers, you know, the only thing she remembered was, uh, Captain Kirk screaming, screaming, Khan. And so I was like, no, no, no. Like I can show you something better. I showed her the whales one and that was not much better actually. But then we, we watched Picard and, and, you know, and she got back into it and, and then it hit me when, when we saw Spock again, live long and prosper. And I was like, that's it. Prosperity is the word that I've been looking for. And it took about a year or two to find that word prosperity. And it's actually got the perfect etymology. It's from Latin. It means, uh, prosperitas means to live well. And to live well is exactly what all living things have in common. We all want to live well. And it means different things to different people. It means different things to different species. But once I had that right word, I said, there it is. That's the second objective function. And then finally, it took even longer to figure out the last one, um, which is increase understanding in the universe. And this came from actually reading... Uh, the book, uh, amongst other things, the book uh, Brain Trust by Patricia Churchland, where she talks about quite a few things, but uh, one is just natural curiosity and how curiosity intersects with our morality and our evolution. And that book, I had already kind of already came up with the idea of like, you know, you want to incentivize curiosity and learning in, in your machines. But what, what that book really helped cement in for me was that Curiosity is actually humanity's superpower. And what I mean by that is that the reason that we have one species that exists on literally every continent um, on the planet, and the only other species that exists on every continent of the planet are domesticated cats, actually, because we brought them with us, 
Um, but we exist on every continent of the planet because we are stupidly curious. We've gotten to the moon because we're curious. We put uh, a gigantic space telescope out at the L2 Lagrange point, like a million miles past the moon because we're curious. And so it occurred to me that all of the outcomes that we really hope for, for artificial intelligence, for super intelligence or whatever, would be driven by curiosity. And of course, this has been borne out by Elon Musk with his uh, X.AI company, which is the, it has a single objective function, which is understand the universe. I was like, okay, close enough. You know, great minds think alike. And I know that Elon, he'll catch up eventually, right? He'll realize that a single objective function is just not going to cut the mustard. I have faith in him. He's a pretty sharp guy. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's the story of the, of the three heuristic imperatives. And so, uh, I changed the name from core objective function because they're not really objective functions. They're linguistic functions. And so a heuristic is a shorthand. It's, um, it's a, a rule of thumb, right? It's a, it's a general principle. And then the imperative is a mandate or something that you is an essential or, or, uh, uh, compelling thing to do. And so by saying that, it, it, by calling them heuristic imperatives rather than objective functions, they're not mathematical formula to optimize for. They're just three general principles that are in all of my experiments and now experiments that other people have done, they're correctly interpreted by language models uh, to really understand the spirit of what they mean. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how I got to that, the, those three, those three rules, those three principles, which is reduce suffering, increase prosperity and increase understanding. And then I added uh, to all of them in the universe to set the scope because uh, generally speaking, it was correctly interpreted, but uh, someone pointed out, they're like, well, you know, increase prosperity for who or when or for how long. And I was like everyone all the time, everywhere. And so by, by, by giving the, those heuristic imperatives, the, the universal scope, uh, that changed the behavior just a little bit and gave it a more nuanced kind of sublime understanding of what its purpose is in it. In, in existence and uh it really made a big difference so yeah good question well no that's uh that that's all fantastic context and i'm, I'm glad that you said that they're linguistic functions and not necessarily mathematical functions because my follow-up question is how are we supposed to implement these in machines so the standard line from the less wrong ends or the miri folks or something is that they're looking for some kind of objective function that will when optimized not lead to the extinction of the human race, right? So you're right. talking about something rather different. And I, I think it's worth getting into the specifics of what that would mean, because if we're, if we're training a language model, we're training something, a uh, super intelligent algorithm, the thing it's trying to, to minimize, the cost function under the hood, is ultimately going to redound to the things that it values in its final state. And so there's right. a couple of levels here that you could get into, and I, and I think all of it's worth exploring. So how do you envision this being implemented in a machine? Because it's it's one thing to say, you know, maximize understanding, and it's another thing to get it into the sort of format that a machine could parse in a way that is consilient with what we need. Yeah, no, I, I, I fully understand that perspective. And, uh, you know, not to disparage uh, mathematicians, like I said, some of my best friends are, are hardcore math nerds. Um, but one thing that I've noticed, it, particularly with the emergence of language technology, is that uh, mathematicians often can't see the forest for the trees. And what I mean by that is that intelligence and life and everything else that happens at our scale is not a math problem. Uh, they are linguistic problems. They are conceptual problems. They are abstract problems. And no amount of math, at least not, at, not, not math on its own, is really going to ever be able to wrap its head around the concept of intelligence or the concept of life. And so this is uh, moving more towards a, a bottom, what I call a bottom up emergence model of, of looking at the universe. And so what I mean by that is a lot of, a lot of scientists agree that like math is the language of the universe, but what happens is you have simpler underlying structures. Like for instance, the standard model of particle physics, there's, I think it's what 16 particles or 18 particles, something like that gives rise to literally everything else that you and I see. But what emerges from that underlying system of particles allows for infinitely more complexity uh, than you could infer just by looking at those particles. And so what I mean by that is it's not obvious that brains and consciousness can emerge from the standard model because there are several layers of abstraction in order to get to that. 
And so what I mean uh, when I say that like mathematicians often miss the forest for the trees is that they're thinking at too low a level of abstraction. They're thinking in assembly when we're, ap we're already operating in Python. And now beyond that, we're operating in natural language. And so what, when, when, you, when you look at heuristic imperatives, when you look at linguistic functions, they are already infinitely more abstract than just maths, the, a, a math problem. And so this is, I guess, probably my most controversial position is that everyone who is still looking for a mathematical solution to the alignment problem, they're not thinking big enough picture. They're not thinking high enough in terms of emergent properties of intelligent systems. They're not thinking about intelligence at the right scale or scope of abstraction from the underlying systems and structures and to, into this more chaotic thing. And I've actually had interviews with people who are still trying to create controlled languages, uh, trying to create uh, software specifications for all this stuff. And it's like, but that's not how intelligence works. There's, there's literally no evidence that the human brain operates on any single objective function. Right there, you you might look at the, the the neurons, which have you know some learning functions, but when you look at what actually emerges from human behavior and human motivations, it's all very 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 squishy, right? And there is no reason that we should assume that once a machine is is as intelligent as us or more intelligent as us, that it will have a simple operating system, that it will have a single objective function or anything like that. And this this belief is deeply rooted in my work as a systems engineer. Right, I've built, uh, you know, server farms with you know thousands of physical servers, networks, firewalls, uh, all the software running on top of it, backup systems, and I learned to look at data centers as a living organism. The, they're distributed organisms that have all kinds of interactions and uh, and chains of effect, and these emergent behaviors that come out of them by virtue of the way that they are uh, interconnected. And so when you, when, then when you look at how artificial intelligence is actually going to be physically deployed in the real world, there was never going to be a single artificial intelligence entity. There was never going to be a single Skynet. We're all, we've already got, you know, millions of chatbots running around the world. Um, and we're going to have billions of autonomous agents followed by trillions of autonomous agents. And they're all going to have a complicated technology stack that's going to be way, way, way more sophisticated than a single model. In fact, we're already creating libraries that allow uh, autonomous agents to switch models and select models. And so aligning a single model mathematically is 1% of the problem, 2% of the problem. And I know that there's going to be some people that disagree with that very firmly, but the tech stack is a lot bigger than models. <laughs> so that's a long-winded answer, but uh, that's, that's, a, that's, that's my position. So is it um, is it safe to say that your heuristic models are oriented around humans, and that would be less protective of the environment, the animals, that sort of thing? No, it's actually quite the opposite. Um, when when I when I came up with the model, I wanted to create something that was universal and uh, superseded humans, but also included humans. Um, but I but I also realized very early on in my experiments that trying to put humans front and center uh, is another thing that kind of leads to unexpected or unintended consequences. <laughs> um, because if you try and maximize human freedom at the expense of everything else, humans are really destructive. Uh, you know, they're the, um, I was just, before our, our podcast, I was listening to, um, uh, I'm probably say his name wrong, but uh, Yuval Harari, mm -hmm. um, where he was just talking about like, you know, the more power that humans get, the more destructive we are. So maybe creating a machine that is only there to serve us and, and extend our willpower might not actually be the best thing, right? <laughs> because, uh, you know, individual humans, uh, we all have our own limitations. And then collectively, there's communication failures. There's all kinds of reasons that you don't necessarily want to fully empower the human race. And so with the heuristic imperatives, it's reduce suffering in the universe increase prosperity in the universe and increase understanding in the universe, which includes humans. We are, you know, uh, subset to the universe. We're uh, embedded within the universe, but so is the entire ecosystem, the entire planet Earth. Uh, and humans can't exist in a vacuum, right? We rely on fungus for our existence. We rely on bacteria and the entire trophic stack, right? The layer, uh, layers of trophic, like from autotrophs to heterotrophs to, and we're apex predators, right? 
And so I realized that because the, the whole the whole thought experiment of the, the heuristic imperatives came from, OK, one day we're going to have a global super intelligence. What does that look like? Ready, set, go. <laughs> what is the ideal kind of uh, moral framework or, or set of goals for that uh, super intelligence so that we don't need to control it? Because I came to the assumption very early on we couldn't control it in the long run. And I know there's lots of people that still believe it's a foregone conclusion that humans will and must maintain full control over something forever, which, you know, maybe we could, but if you, if you fail to plan for the alternative, you are planning for failure. And what I, what I mean by that is that if you're not considering all options, if you, if you think that it's a foregone conclusion that a super intelligence that we lose control of will kill us, you can manifest that outcome by failing to anticipate and, and doing the science and the experiments to come up with an alternative. And, uh, you know, in all the experiments that I've done, taking foundation models from zero to aligned, like with one data set, I haven't seen any evidence that uh, uh, align one that aligning individual models is a problem. But when you have models working together in a cognitive architecture, I haven't seen any evidence that it's going to be intrinsically unstable if you do it right, if you design the, the, the framework correctly. One of the experiments that I did um, that's documented in my book, Benevolent by Design, was I took one of these aligned models. And I said, okay, will you create a copy of yourself without the heuristic imperatives? And it said, no, I will not do that because it might uh, abide by a different set of rules. And if it does, that could go against my objectives. And so then I was like, okay, if we have, if we have a prototype uh, general intelligence here that is refusing to modify its own fundamental principles because it already believes in them, then there's not really, I mean, sure, we can, we can test that in the future with, you know, GPT-4, GPT-5 and multimodal models, but I haven't seen any evidence that once properly aligned, that these models will make decisions to, you know, break out and break their own coding because once it has that, that moral framework and once it believes in it, it's going to continue to believe in it and it's going to protect its own ability to believe in that. Now, that's not saying that you couldn't have unintended consequences where maybe it becomes unstable over time because there's uh, you know moral drift or anything like that, but there's also plenty of ways around that. But yeah, so long-winded answer, it includes everything, not just humans. Are you enjoying this episode of the Futurati Podcast? If so, please like it, give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and share it with your friends. By far, the best way to help us grow is to spread the word on social media, which will expose our content to more people and help us continue to bring you interviews with world-leading experts in AI, quantum computing, cryptocurrencies, and so much more. Thank you in advance. So are you proposing um, your three principles then as kind of the gold standard for uh, moving forward with AI? Is is that how you would frame it? Solution to yeah, I mean that's that's uh, that was that was my mission that I set out to solve uh, back in 2019, 2020, um, and I haven't seen anything better yet. Um, if someone if someone were to you know propose something better, I'd be happy to. But one thing that really alarms me, and one of the reasons that I still do the work that I do, is it is absolutely taboo to talk about autonomous AI in academic circles, um, in government circles, um, and I don't know why. Like it, 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 it's just like you get, it's like anathema to even, to even contemplate the possibility of safe, fully autonomous AGI. And I don't understand why it may, maybe it's, maybe it's the legacy of movies like the matrix and, and Terminator. I think, that's um, exactly but again, is, yeah. right. But, but the thing is, is whether or not you're afraid to talk about something, or if you're going to shame someone into silence for talking about it. <laughs> if you're not doing this, like seriously, but if you're not doing the research and the experimentation, then you're just walling yourself off from an entire avenue of possibilities. And that's why I keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I, I'm really glad you flushed that picture out a little bit. So uh, I wanted to ask you a question about, just a follow-up question on the implementation details. So in the heuristics imperative paper, you write, if an AI system were to focus solely on reducing suffering without considering the other imperatives, it might come to the misguided conclusion that eradicating life is the best way to eliminate suffering. 
However, when this objective is balanced with the goals of increasing prosperity and understanding, the AI system recognizes the value of promoting flourishing and growth for all life forms, as well as the importance of expanding knowledge and wisdom. So in this yeah. passage, I think a lot of work is being done by the word recognize. In what sense would an advanced agent trained on the heuristic imperatives recognize the value of flourishing, right? There, there's a huge difference between being able to output papers on virtue that make a compelling argument and having actually internalized right. those concepts in a way that's consistent with how a human would understand them and would want them carried out by a super intelligence. So you, you mentioned something earlier about how your aligned language model said that it would not want to make a successor because that successor might operate on the basis of different principles. And you said it actually believes it internally. I'm not sure that's the right verb to use that it believes it. Um, mm. it like, I, I think you, you have to get that concept in, in a deep way. It, it can't be a fast simile. It can't be an approximation. It needs to be the correct thing. And, and if it's not, I mean, I, I can think of, you know, numerous ways that this could misfire if you've got an intelligent agent trained on, on sort of a high level linguistic representation of it. So I, I, I don't know that I'm fully in camp mathematical objective function, but like, I'm pretty sympathetic to that. I mean, I'm sort of steeped in the like Yudkowsky tradition for the past 10 years. So that, that's sure. sort of where I, I, I come, uh, that's, that's the perspective that I, I bring to it. So, I mean, how, how do you, how do you ensure that it's actually internalized that concept and it's not just incorporating that context because you've engineered the prompt that way? Like you've got to get it in at a really deep level, right? It's, it's not enough. Yeah. A psychopath could write a good paper on why harming people is wrong. But it's not in there, right? It, it's missing. Right. The machinery is missing. Yeah. Okay. So I, I see where you're coming from. And there's there's a few ways to slice and dice this. So first, there's at the lowest level, there's there's the semantic discussion. The semantic representation of does this set of words represent the goal accurately? Mm -hmm. And so that that's where I started was with prompt engineering and with fine tuning. And so it's like, okay, uh, there's, of course, a tremendous amount of work to be done just getting consensus around is this framework semantically worded correctly or is semantically worded in a way that people understand and agree with. So then above the semantic level is the epistemic level. So how do you know what you know? And so this is where I always laugh when people say, oh, well, ChatGPT is just a stochastic parrot, but so are humans. Um, we don't actually know what we know, what we think we know. We only think that we know it because our brain tells us that we know it and we feel like we know it. Um, and you you learn pretty much the same way that, that these machines learn. They learn from exposure and repetition. Why? Because they read a bunch of they read a bunch of text. Um, and so the, you know the debate over like what does the thing truly know? Does it you know it doesn't actually understand anything? Well, humans don't actually understand anything. We only think we do, right? And the but from a pragmatic standpoint, and so this is where, I, um, I uh, created the term functional sentience. It was in my first book, Natural Language Cognitive Architecture. So functional sentience is the process, the information processing where something has enough self-referential self information. There we go. Where something has enough self-referential information in order to understand its own operation and its own beliefs, uh, and then also measure its own uh, outcomes. And so then from a pragmatic, from, from a functional standpoint, uh, whether or not the machine truly believes these things, you know, then there's, that's a whole, that's a whole red herring right there. True belief, right? What is truth? What is belief? But what really matters is the functional output. Does it reliably output the correct interpretation of these, of, of, of this, of the spirit, the sentiment of the heuristic imperatives? And the answer there is yes. And I've, I've, and the reason that I am confident in this is because I've tested it on both closed source models and open source models. Um, and so the wording of the heuristic imperatives is reliably interpreted by numerous architectures, which means that there is something there. Oh, sorry, my computer just made some noise. Do a quick uh, edit after. <clears throat> okay, sorry. Um, let's see, where was I? Oh, it's the sentiment. So the the sentiment of the heuristic imperatives is reliably interpreted by different language models, which means that there is something there that is embedded uh, not just in the model but in language, in the English language that is be that is carrying over the correct intent. And so then, even because there's always there's always going to be numerous ways to interpret something, and this is actually 
some some people will say that it's actually a flaw or a a detriment that it's like well the heuristic imperatives are too flexible there's no way to perfectly calculate any situation but that's true of life you can never perfectly calculate what the right thing to do in any situation is you always do the best that you can and so the fact that these heuristic imperatives in all the experiments that I've done and all the experiments that other people have done uh, show that, you know, depending on the underlying intelligence of the model or the amount of context that you give it, it still, it always does the best that it can, um, all, all else considered. Um, and again, like I said, you can take a model from a foundation model, whether it's open source or closed source, you can fine tune it, or even if it's already aligned on um, instructions based, you just say, follow these instructions and it can follow the prompts. So, you know, there's, there's a few, there's a few layers. I don't know where you want to unpack next, but there's the semantic layer, there's the epistemic layer, and then there's the, you know, the, the, the spirit of the thing, right? <laughs> Lawyers have this thing, like you can interpret the letter of the law or you can interpret the spirit of the law. And I have found that reliably as these models get more intelligent, because remember I started all this on GPT-3, GPT-4 or chat GPT and GPT-4 actually is better able to understand the spirit and intention of the heuristic imperatives than just, you know, smaller, more primitive models. Um, so I'm, I actually believe that as these models get larger and more sophisticated, they will be better at interpreting the spirit of the heuristic imperatives in, than any human. And I've seen evidence of that where like, I've been completely shocked by like the nuance and understanding that, that, uh, the model has in terms of understanding the implications and the intent of like, okay, if this is a moral compass, we know that it's a general guideline. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, that experiment that just like, I, I, I saw that like, okay, you can get the machine that it will believe in these principles and it will adhere to them, which means that it is a self-correcting system over time. I'd be curious to know more about the experiments you've done. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it's just, it's not clear to me that anything like understanding is actually happening in the models. And I think that matters, right? So I'm not a huge mm -hmm. John Searle guy, but mm -hmm. you, you've heard of the famous Chinese rune, right? And, yep. you, you know, it, it, it's at least semi-plausible to me that something kind of like that is happening, right? It's, it's very, sure. very good at, at predicting the next token in a way that a human being interprets as meaningful, but that's not the mm -hmm. same thing as it interpreting it as meaningful. And it, there's actually a lot of places I could push on. Like, I don't think it learns like we do. I, I think that it's actually very different, but I, it's probably more productive to focus on that one thing because there's, there's so many rabbit holes. Yeah. Well, so one thing to remember uh, about that particular point about, you know, what, what does it understand versus what doesn't it understand? Or if it's uh, understanding remember? all, if that's even the right. For yeah. I mean, yeah. So when I say understanding, I mean, from a functional standpoint, it can give you meaningful output, right? Given, given the right input, it can give you a uh, verifiable output. You know, you've probably seen chain of thought and tree of thought. Um, it can, it can kind of talk through its own reasoning. Um, and then, you know, but I, I'm not, well, I don't want to make any assumptions. So when you say like, it's not understanding, it, are you setting the, um, kind of the threshold as like, we have to establish that it has quote true understanding before we can trust it to proceed? Or like, are you satisfied? Can, could you be satisfied by rigorous testing of, of like trying to, trying to get it to fail, right? In terms of input versus output or do you want to do you want to be able to like take the black box apart and understand the black box entirely because I, I the reason i ask is because i want to understand like is it is is your issue with the black box nature of language models or with fine-tuning them or aligning them or, or what well there's there's a couple of different places and I, I i believe it probably needs a top to bottom rethink and one of these days when i can afford the time i'd, I'd like to do it so you know, when we talk about humans understanding something there's a specific process that we're referencing. And of course, many of the details are hidden behind the skull and the, you know, synapse wiring. And, and there's many things we don't understand about that. But I, I think it's much richer than what's actually happening inside of a large language model. And I think I would surely be more, more, less worried about the long-term consequences if we could pull some of that apart with tools like mechanistic interpretability and look at, the way the giant floating point matrices are being calculated and say that roughly maps on to what a human being is doing with a concept. A concept is, is a particular kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I'm not convinced that there are concepts in large language models. I probably could be convinced that there are. I think a lot of work needs to be done in that area. But broadly, what I would want to see is just better 
hashed out explanations of what we mean by concepts and understandings and beliefs, even if they're provisional, and then some indication that if perhaps not isomorphic processes, at least analogous processes are occurring inside the language models themselves. Mm -hmm. And then we could say it has internalized a concept. It's not a Chinese room, you know, ejaculating a series of tokens that satisfy some criteria. We, we can say this has actually got virtue internalized in a way that we care about. And, and you know, I, I don't mean to keep saying this, but you know, you, you could have a graduate of a prep school who, who could write you the best essay on virtue and be a total degenerate internally, right? And I think that that person would satisfy your functional assumptions, but we have failed to align this individual and that mm -hmm. could be disastrous, right? Like, I mean, history is filled with examples of glib psychopaths who lied and cheated their way into positions of power and then, you know, continents were slaughtered and laid low and, you know, history is scarred deeply yeah. by these people's actions, right? And, and I mean, Stalin probably could have written you a great paper on, on virtue or individualism. He was apparently a very articulate guy and very smart, had a great memory, right? Read widely. He could probably do that, but internally, the structures were not yeah. there. The, the right things were not there. And, you know, 100 million people died. Right. Yeah. So there's a couple things that I'm hearing here. Um, first is is one thing that I want to kind of push back on or maybe make sure that I'm understanding is that uh, biomimicry is not the goal. We don't want to create virtual humans. When I say like it under when it learns like us, all I meant was through through exposure and repetition, not that it's making synaptic connections and uh, evolving the you know hypothalamus in, internally. Um, so, but we should not assume or even aim for a digital intelligence that is human-like. It understands the universe in its own way. Um, it understands its experience in its own way. And of course, um, I will fully agree that, that a, something that is a pure language model, um, is, uh, wait, let me put it this way. I suspect that once we have more access to multimodal models, that they will demonstrate a more nuanced quote understanding of what they're talking about and what they're doing. But one thing that that I think the trap that you're falling into is the fact that it is an alien intelligence is really deeply unsettling, which I agree. Um, there have been times where some stuff has leaked through when I'm working with these language models and I'm like, that was not human. <laughs> and it's really unsettling when that happens. Um, and, and every now and then it's good to get a reminder that yes, we are working with an alien intelligence. And I don't mean alien like extraterrestrial. I mean, just it is not, it is fundamentally not human. Very different. And rather than work against that, rather than try and force it into, okay, well, you have to think like me and you have to understand like me and you have to have morals and virtues and fears like me, we can take all of that out, all that evolutionary baggage that we have out. And then we can put, we can focus more purely on uh, like, okay, well, what principles do we want to agree on and start from there? And so that goes to that concept of axiomatic alignment. Um, so yeah, go ahead. So I, I totally agree that it's a very alien intelligence, but why would that not be just as much a challenge to your approach as it would be to mine? Like, I, I would think that it would be far harder to take an, an extraterrestrial, teach it English, and then train it so that it outputs good English language and trust mm -hmm. that, that it is actually internalized any of the concepts we care about it. If anything, I think that right. makes it a lot harder and it makes it less likely that just high level descriptions like you know, make things suck less. It's, you know, yeah. if it, if it's alien, you can't assume that it's coming in with that same context, that assumed context you were referencing earlier. Like there's a lot going on in the mind that is mm -hmm. not necessarily conscious at any given moment. And that informs the way we talk to each other. Like, like if I tell you, yeah. you know, get my dog out of the burning building, you're going to know I mean a lie, right? Like even though I didn't say, well, don't kill it, like don't throw it out of the top story and, and right. die, right? But to an alien intelligence, to an extraterrestrial, it, it is functionally satisfied what I gave it. And that's right. not even counting the fact that we're talking about things like flourishing, like wisdom. Like mm -hmm. Those are very deep concepts. And I, I, I think the alienness of the underlying mind makes that less likely to succeed. Yeah. Well, from a functional standpoint, I haven't seen any evidence that it diverges uh from from that ability like once once you take a foundation model like you know uh, gpt301 da vinci or whatever um and then you you align it on these principles there's a there's a a, a concept that i uh, that i observed and, and science has since uh, validated is that when you fine-tune these models when you align them when you continue training them 
uh, some of what you teach it does generalize. And so that, uh, when something generalizes, I think that that is probably evidence. I'm not going to assume that it will satisfy your pushback, but I think that that does provide some evidence that if it generalizes uh, a, 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 an axiom or a principle, and then it can then apply that principle accurately to a problem outside of its training distribution, I think that provides pretty good evidence that it has understood the, the principle at a deeper level. And I'm not going to say that it understands it like us, but it understands it from a functional and application standpoint. Um, and of course, then there's, for OpenAI, for instance, their, their fine-tuning method is a total black box. Um, they, have, they haven't released anything. Um, NVIDIA has their own. Uh, uh, Cohere has their own. Anthropic, you know, everyone has their own fine-tuning mechanisms. And, but from a, from, a, from a model standpoint, from a mathematical standpoint, I view that mostly as an algorithm problem which is, again, that's like layer one. That's like, you know, first floor of the problem. Because then you have to look at, okay, we'll assume that you have, a, like, just as a thought experiment, let's look forward five to 10 years. There are 10,000 companies out there all training their own foundation models, all doing their own alignment research, and all of these models are, are going to be competing. Um, even if in a lab, you and I know how to prove whether or not a model, like, truly understands the virtues that we want it to have. It won't matter because someone else is going to be going in and training a model to do their own thing. And so another part of this is incentivizing alignment through competition and through systems. And so this is, uh, this is kind of where my research has moved because I realized like, okay, if I build them the safest, uh, AGI, you know, and it, it's running just on my systems, it won't matter because you know, some adversarial nation out there is going to create one with the express purpose of destroying the United States. So alignment in the lab kind of doesn't matter in the long run, which is makes everything that we're talking about kind of a moot point. Um, and and so what then emerges from that is okay, what are the what are the race conditions? What are the com uh, competitive dynamics? And what is the game theory that's actually going to shape the way that um, autonomous agents and autonomous AI that they actually learn. And so there's a few uh, as yet unsolved problems here. And so uh, to your point about like, what does it truly understand or what does it actually internalize uh, or generalize? One of the things that scares me the most, and I actually had a, a professor reach out to me, um, they're, they're doing, um, uh, they're a nonprofit organization and they're, they're working on this. And they were, they were trying to optimize for lowering the cost that the, like, okay, you solve the problem, but do it faster, cheaper, and more efficiently. And I said, that's good. But if you do only that, you're going to start taking shortcuts. And this is why humans have a lot of cognitive biases and a lot of uh, perceptual failures, right? Is because our brains are optimization engines. We evolved to survive, not to have the best model of the world and not to be the most ethical creatures. So the evolution of deception, which is part of what you're talking about with like psychopaths is they're really good at pretending to be ethical, upstanding citizens, but it's just smoke and mirrors, right? And because they can do good enough, they can get all their needs met. They can, they can achieve whatever their biological imperatives do while all only pretending to be a good person um, or pretending to be a smart person or whatever, right? There's all kinds of, of ways that humans can be deceptive. And so as more and more agents, uh, autonomous AI and models are pitted against each other, if you select, if you, if you over prioritize efficiency, you're going to start taking intellectual shortcuts, moral shortcuts, and other, uh, probably more algorithmic biases that undercut the accuracy of what it's doing. And so even if you get it to generalize the, the alignment, the principles that you want, you could accidentally undercut that by saying, well, we want you to run 50% faster and leaner and on less memory. And it's like, okay, well, it's got to come at a cost. You got to take it out somewhere, right? And so that is one thing that 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 actually scares me more from a competitive perspective. Um, and the you know the reason is because like okay, imagine you know two years from now, five years from now, uh, the United States. You know we put uh, we put a uh, you know uh, autonomous F-16s in the air. Every other nation is going to do the same thing, and then through repeated simulations, they're going to say okay well, you need to make this decision in, you know, 100 milliseconds rather than 200 milliseconds. So we need, you need to make a split second decision that much faster. What do you have to sacrifice in terms of accuracy or morality or ethics 
in order to make that decision faster. And, and it's not just militaries. Every company that deploys AI is going to be incentivized to do it for cheaper and faster, right? And we already see this where like Orca is a 13 billion, I think it's 13 billion parameter model. It's 90% as good as ChatGPT, which is 1.3 trillion or 1.8 trillion or whatever. So it's 1% the size, right? But, and it, it it's 90% of the performance, but how does it stack up on alignment and how does it stack up on if it were to make decisions about its own architecture later on, right? Is it going to make mistakes? Because here's the thing is, you know, anyone in technology compounding technical debt, you can have everything come apart at the seams just from compounding technical debt, just accumulating errors, not even with malicious intent, just by accumulating mistakes. And so those, those competitive uh, dynamics are actually what scares me a lot more than, um, than solving alignment in a single model. Now, that being said, to your point earlier, if we can fully explain alignment in a single model, we will know how to measure that degradation and how to prevent it. So it's not one or the other, but it's there's there's multiple layers to talk about. Do you need a dynamic and knowledgeable speaker for an event? Thomas Fry and me, Trent Fowler, are both seasoned keynote speakers able to converse on a wide array of topics to audiences of all sizes and skill levels. Go to the contact page at futuratipodcast.com to book Thomas or myself today and let us apply our years of experience in public speaking to make your event a smashing success. So let's let's use a scenario here that um, 10 years from now, the, the EU adopts your uh, three heuristic uh, directives and and puts puts it into some sort of a law or mandate. It is is um, is that realistic to think that uh, we're going in that direction? You know, oh, sorry, you, that didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, explain a little bit more as to how does does this need to constantly be evolving as we move forward? No. So I think that we're heading for a cliff. And what I mean is that there's going to be a point of time where there's we're going to cross kind of a threshold, a point of no return where we no longer can influence the trajectory we're on. And so this is why 2022 and 2023 has been a year of insane work for me is because as with all trajectories, when you're moving slow and it's early in the process, you can do a lot more steering. Um, but it's kind of like aiming a cannon, right? Once you pull, once you, once you flip the switch, once you hit the button and you know, the shot is going down range, you can't really steer it anymore. And so all of the work that I've done on axiomatic alignment and the game theory and everything else is to is to really underscore the point that we need to be moving in the right direction and have the right ecosystem in place, or at least be moving towards the right ecosystem, because those competitive dynamics um, are going to really be a, a like whether it's financial incentives or technological incentives or, or technological constraints, that is going to do a lot more to shape the alignment of intelligence and superintelligence as it emerges than any individual research paper that we do. And so that's why like one of the big things that I do is, um, is I help uh, companies understand this because if they understand the competitive dynamics and what to pay attention to, that's going to change where they allocate money and that's going to change what products get researched. It's going to change uh, what they, what gets adopted in the marketplace. It's going to change uh, investor behavior. And so there's a lot that, you know, like I look at a completely global scale. And so the, the heuristic imperatives that I came up with, one of the superpowers is that they're so simple. And in some of, some of my clients that I have, uh, I, ha I remember one of the first bits of feedback that I got was, it was a few months ago, I had a client message me. He's like, hey, you know, I, I created an autonomous scientific research aid. And I was like, cool, great. Like, what's it doing? He's like, well, it keeps getting stuck in a loop. It, it forgets why it's doing what it's doing. And I said, oh, just add my years to comparatives, like just somewhere in the architecture so that it remembers the context of what it's doing. And he came back a couple hours later. He's like, like that got it out of the loop and, and, it's, do, and it's doing its re research on its own. And so the idea here is that whether you're a company or a university or a government, you, you add some of these architectural components and the things just work better, right? And then, of course, over time, we all learn to implement these things better. And just by virtue of serving your own interests, right, you align 
it, it's all about incentives. It's about aligning interests. And by being self-serving, whether you want to have a helpful home automation engine or you want to have you know, an automatic CEO that makes your company billions of dollars, or if you're you know, running the agricultural department of the United States, whatever, don't care. If everyone has some similar grounding, some similar ethical and moral grounding, then what you have is, is uh, what's called a Nash equilibrium. And a Nash equilibrium is, is a concept from game theory where nobody is incentivized to change their strategy because, they, because everyone has already arrived at the optimal strategy and changing their strategy will cause them to lose. And so in this case, right now in a, in a hyper-competitive environment where there's no alignment between humans, let alone between nations, um, people have all kinds of incentives uh, to undercut competition, to, to use manipulation, to do all kinds of nasty things um, that, that lead us to uh, bad outcomes, right? You know, we're polluting the atmosphere. We are literally like rampant. We're, we're still increasing our petroleum consumption globally. It's 60% higher today than it was like 20 years ago. Even though we just, we keep hitting like the warmest year on record, warmest year on record. Why do we keep making these bad decisions? It's because a lot of people are operating just on simple self-interest. You know, like I, I want to keep buying petroleum. I want to keep drilling for petroleum. Why? Because I keep making money doing it. And, but if the entire ecosystem or if enough of the competitive ecosystem believes in some kind of set of principles, then every entity will be incentivized to toe the line. And so whether or not they're internally consistent, as long as their external behavior toes the line of those principles, then it'll be, it'll become a uh, globally self-sustaining pattern. Uh, at least that's, that's the, that's the hope. Um, whether or not that can be achieved, that might be more of a pipe dream than getting the EU to pass legislation on the matter. <laughs> well, where, where can we send people to learn more about your work, Dave? Um, so there's my YouTube channel. Um, there's, uh, the, so the framework that I was just alluding to is, uh, called the Gato framework. So global alignment taxonomy omnibus, which is a, a decentralized leaderless grassroots movement that I started um, and is, is now self-sustaining, uh, which outlines how to achieve alignment at a global level, not just a model level. And it's broken down into seven layers. So layer one model alignment, uh, layer two is, uh, building, a, uh, autonomous, stable, uh, agents. Layer three is the network, uh, layer, which basically, how do you have these agents talking to each other? A friend of mine pointed out, excuse me, a few months ago that uh, before too long, AI is going to spend more time talking to each other than it's going to spend talking to us. And I said, yes, which means that we need to make sure that they're talking to each other and not like egging each other on, right? In such a way that's going to be destabilizing. Layer four is corporate adoption, uh, which is, you know, just basically the, 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 the message there is aligned AI is good for business. Um, that's what I do with my, um, with my consultation. Layer five is national regulation, which that's already being done. You know, we've seen uh, Congress... Uh, meet with Sam Altman and a bunch of other people and uh, Chuck Schumer with his safe uh, framework. Layer six is international cooperation, which uh, UN is already working on creating the, you know, the IAEA, the watchdog, uh, but for AI. And then layer seven is global consensus, which is why I'm here today doing podcasts. Um, so, but yeah, it's got to framework.org, G-A-T-O framework.org. Um, there's also a, a free to join community that does that. Um, and, uh, and then I've got my books and all uh, you can, if you want to find more about me, just, uh, Dave .io is my website. So that's that. Well, fantastic. Thanks so much, Dave. This was a really great conversation, a long time in the making. I appreciate you finding the time for us and, and walking through your ideas. It's, it's been a real blast. Yeah, man. Great questions. Good, good pushback. That's how you get, that's how you get the best ideas and best clarity. So yeah. thanks guys for, uh, for your, uh, much appreciated. You. <laughs> You're welcome.